Good morning. We will start with our chorus. You are the king of us to sit and do nothing. You want us to be on the move. 
taking risks to change our world and save our lives. Help us then to draw close to you, to be ready to listen and then to act. Amen. Now we're going to have our first reading. I'm reading from James 3, verses 1 to 12, Taming the Tongue. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with the bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships, though they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed, and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. This is the word of the Lord. Stand now and sing together, <clears throat> for I'm building a people of power. And we'll sing this through twice, because it's quite short. <laughs> Others, one of the prophets. 
But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Jesus predicts his death. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. The way of the cross. Then he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes into his Father's glory with the holy angels. This is the word of the Lord. to try and ascertain what's, what's the matter with us. They're essential for teaching purposes at all levels, including, of course, teaching language for very small infants, right, right from the word go. And we wait for, for our children to utter their first syllables and swear that we, we heard a proper word, even though actually it was a series of kind of grunts. And, of course, Often the first word is dada, and less often mum mum. I, I, I'm assuming it's because it's more difficult to make the, that, that sound. You remember the incredible sensation when your first boy or girlfriend told them they loved you. The power of words. The power of, of I'm sorry when it's truly meant. It, it just goes on and on. And on the other side of that, did you know, it's a useless bit of, of trivia really, that for every word of Adolf Hitler's book, Mein Kampf, over a hundred lives were lost in World War II. That's sober, isn't it? Words heal, they wound, they offer comfort, they teach, and they destroy. I have to start wondering if there is, in fact, any human force that's potentially more effective or destructive. It was his first day on the job. He was working in the green grocery department of a supermarket. A lady came up to him and said she wanted to buy half a lettuce. He tried to dissuade her, but she persisted. And he said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to go talk to my manager. So he went to the back of the shop and found the manager, not realising the woman had followed him. When he got to the back of the shop, he said to the manager, there's some stupid old woman out there who wants to buy half a head of lettuce. What should I tell her? <laughs> Seeing the horrified look on his manager's face, he turned round and seeing the woman, he said, and this nice lady would like to buy the other half. <laughs> Will that be all right? He's got a career in politics or something, hasn't he? The manager was highly relieved by this quick kind of thinking and said that would be fine. Later, 
in the day, he congratulated the boy on his quick thinking and said, where are you from? The boy said, I'm from uh, Toronto in Canada, the home of beautiful hockey players and ugly women. <laughs> the manager said, my wife is from Toronto. He's got a real talent, this boy, hasn't he? <laughs> and the boy said, oh, which team did she play for? <laughs> Our tongues can get us into an awful lot of trouble. We can relate to, to where that boy was. We've all done it at some point, haven't we? Said something and then wish desperately we hadn't, and especially when it's been overheard. It, it's, it's a horrible feeling. Three, another story, three ministers went, went fishing out sort of in the wilds. And while they were there, they began to talk about their innermost thoughts. One confessed he'd been guilty of certain sins, and he named them and urged the other two to confess their weaknesses too. The second one said he had some weaknesses and recounted them for the others. The third minister remained quiet for a long time, and then when he was pressed by the others to reveal his weaknesses, he said, Oh dear, I don't think you want to know my weaknesses, but since you insist, I'm going to tell you. I love to gossip, and I can hardly wait to get home. <laughs> the Bible refers to a wicked tongue, a deceitful tongue, gossiping, backbiting, blaspheming, foolish, whispering, cursing, and lots of other things. And it's apparent then that with this much about the tongue, it's a very important part of the human body. A very powerful muscle in more ways than one. In the passage from James that John read for us, we can see three things that will enable us to keep our tongue from becoming a danger. It has the power to control our lives. James gives us examples with horses and ships. He's telling us that something small can steer something quite big. Compared to the size of a horse, the bit that's put into its mouth is, is relatively small. And again, compared to the size of the ship, a rudder is small. But both work to steer and direct something very significantly bigger. It has the power to hurt and destroy and throw away remarks, can change people's lives irreparably. When I managed a community centre a number of years ago now, I have told this story before, but it, it, it touched me at the time. We had a lot of people coming and going, like here, for classes and that sort of thing. And a, a, a lady of significant years, well into her 80s, came into the uh, centre for the first time for her sewing class or whatever it was. And as she came through the door, I, I said hello to her and she went white. And I had to get her a chair. And I said, like you do, are you okay, lovely? You know, are, are you alright? She said, yes, I'm alright, dear. But I haven't been in here since I came to school in this building. It was an old Victorian school since I came to school in this building and my teacher shouted at me and made me sit in that corner over there wearing a dunce's hat. That had been 70 odd years before and there it still was, that speech and that action of that person back all those years ago. James tells us the tongue is a corrupting force and he's trying to make an important point. Never underestimate the power of words to hurt somebody. It can destroy so much. He calls the term a restless evil, full of deadly poison. That's on the Shakespearean. Never underestimate its power. Someone once said that a closed mouth gathers no feet. And someone else said, if your mind goes blank, don't forget to turn off the sound. Because we do stuff without thinking. We say stuff without thinking, without realising. And that, 
brings me back, I suppose, to almost where I started. Tongues are capable of wonderful things too, of positive things, of expressions of love and thanksgiving and positive reinforcement and all of those things. I like this little story of, it's a, it's always a minister in these stories. Anyway, he was making a wooden trellis for a climbing plant in his garden. And as he was nailing away, he noticed that a little boy had come along and was watching him. The youngster didn't say anything, so the minister kept on working, thinking the lad would leave. But he didn't. Pleased at the thought that his work was being admired, the minister said to the little boy, you're trying to pick up some pointers, are you? No, he said, I'm just waiting to hear what the minister says when he hits his thumb with a hammer. <laughs> can use our capacity for speech so positively. And we have all said things that we wish we could take back or change. And I guess we will again, because however much it's excruciating when we know we've done it, we, we, still, do, we still do stuff again, differently maybe, but it's still an ongoing issue. My mum used to say, if you can't think of anything good to say, say nothing. There are other takes on that, if you can't think of anything kind and all of those things, say nothing. And I'd like just to touch on a couple of the themes from the Gospel reading here, about being called. And again, there's an inference in that word called that that's about speech. There is a spiritual calling, but the word call it, it implies use of the voice, of course. It's about... Jesus warning Peter to guard his words about taking up our cross, about a willingness to follow without shame and with joy. I was a shy, nervous child and reluctant to speak out. I know that's hard to believe now, but it's true. And it changed over time, and when I was first called to ministry, as, as you all know by now, I'm sure. I went and saw my then parish priest, who kind of disregarded me, because I was a woman after all. And it was going to be another 25 plus years before I responded again. And then I started in ministry, and that journey's taken me some 20 odd years so far to get to where I am now. It's a journey like no other. Many apparently unlikely people have ministerial gifts. And I like to say this every now and again to remind you all that it's true, because it's important. Look at Moses. He was a stammerer with a temper. He was still quite an effective leader and minister. Peter, who seemed to get things wrong so often on so many levels, turned out to be a very effective uh, minister, pastor. I would ask every one of you to consider if you've heard the call, if you've heard any kind of call to any kind of ministry. It doesn't matter how old, it doesn't matter what, but we all need to keep revisiting whether God is calling us. And if so, what we're being called to. And that may take time. When God calls us and we finally answer yes, we get what we need to do whatever it is. <clears throat> God will reassure us. He never said it would be easy. It's like the plaque that was seen in a church somewhere that said, faith makes things possible, not easy. Is God calling you to step out in faith? To say yes to something when you'd really much rather say no? Or ignore it? We have to be open to sensing any kind of call. And Peter struggled in many ways. Then he accepted his commission and proceeded to make a mess of it. But God didn't give up on him. Service doesn't come with big fancy ribbons or collars necessarily. 
It comes in all shapes and forms. It's the humble things that provide us with the deepest sense of joy and affect the team that is our fellowship so profoundly. Jesus said those who are willing to lose their life for his sake will find it. Rembrandt painted a famous work of the crucifixion called the Three Crosses, which hangs in Paris here in the Louvre. And he did something unusual. Amongst the faces in the crowd at the foot of the cross, he painted himself. It was his way of saying he couldn't envisage the crucifixion without admitting that he had a part in it. We all need to see that. We need to identify with the Christ on the cross rather than the Rembrandt in the crowd. The gospel passage ought to make us a bit uncomfortable. Jesus came to die for us. His disciples struggled with that message. But he came to die for us because that is how much he loves us. In the words of the writer Max Licardo, nails didn't hold God to a cross. Love did. Amen. And now we are going to sing together, Will You Come and Follow Me? Lord, in your mercy, is here our prayer. 
so many people in our world are taking risks with their lives for causes they believe in. We think of those in Afghanistan who have taken to the streets to protest. It's difficult for us to comprehend how frightening it must be for these people living in this reality. And we pray for safety. We pray for those showing huge courage, that their voices might be heard and that we would listen and pray for them. We pray that leaders all over the world use the power they have to guide those who need it with their brothers and sisters at the heart of what they do. Loving God, draw close to people who are feeling unsafe and who are living with conflict. May we see and be inspired by those who take risks for justice. Lord, in your mercy. Caring has been very much in the news this week, and we're reminded of the cost of care for those who do the caring. And we pray for our medical profession working under huge strain and beginning to be affected by what has happened over the last year. We pray that they may feel supported and that they may have opportunity for rest. We pray for all those in caring professions and for all those who are sick in body, mind or spirit. Loving God, draw close to all those who care and to all those who are sick waiting for operations or tests. May we see and be inspired by those who care for others. Lord, in your mercy. We're aware of many people fighting for climate justice. We give you thanks, Lord, for people who care about the environment and are not afraid to speak out. We pray for young people who are becoming proactive. May they be determined rather than daunted by the scale of the challenge. Many of us know of people around the world facing persecution. Brothers and sisters who live in countries hostile to their beliefs. We pray for persecuted Christians around the world that they may find safe spaces and may they powerfully feel the presence of your Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy. Finally, Lord, we pray for ourselves. Whatever circumstances face us in the week to come and face those we love, may we face them in the knowledge that you are always with us. May we learn how to let go of the things of this world that weigh us down or distract us. Loving God, draw close to all of us this week as we work out what discipleship means. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We pray together now in the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in
Loving God, we commit to following you this week into the corners of the community we may prefer to ignore. Help us to pray and speak and act for change with your people at the heart of all of these things. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with us and remain with us always.